All right. Um, hello, everybody. I guess uh, this is a, a session ex interpretability and explainable AI that we will be starting uh, uh, with the Arati and uh, myself. Uh, so uh, I guess without further ado, uh, if we have uh, the speakers uh, ready, I see uh, Joseph Kanner. Maybe. So you have three minutes each. Uh, please go ahead. So Kanner first, and then uh, Joseph, and then Abhijit. Uh, do you hear my voice? Yes. Okay, yes. sounds good. Yes, we do. So shall I start? Yes, please. Okay, definitely. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen now. Uh, can you see it? Yes, we do. Okay. So, hello everyone. Um, I'm Jan Arzak, and I'm presenting a short summary of our work, Explainable Image Call, the Analysis of Chest X-rays. So, the main motivation of our paper is to propose a framework which can speed up the image acquisition process by adopting a foreign object classification system on chest X-rays. We aim this system to warn the radiologists when there are foreign objects on a patient, and as a result of that, Reacquisition procedure will immediately be performed. Also, we aim for the interpretability of this system for a possible clinical usage while ensuring the reliability of the interpretability method. In our paper, we evaluate the reliability by measuring the correspondence between the interpretation method and the ground truth bounding box annotations. So, in our paper, we utilize norm grade in order to interpret the spatial contributions of a target layer in a pre-trained neural network for foreign object classification on chest X-rays. It can be seen that a virtual identity layer is placed right between CNN and global average pooling layers. This will help us to gather the activations and gradients of a target layer at an exact position which will be combined to obtain a spatial contribution. If we had placed a virtual identity convolution layer, which has a kernel size of one by one, the spatial contribution is obtained by subfetting the activations and gradients along the channel axis and taking the dot product. We then reshape the spatial contribution in order to preserve the original layer's spatial size. Lastly, we take the Frobenius norm along the channel axis and assemble the output to the original image size. Thus, we localize the foreign objects within a patient record if those are present according to the neural network decision. So uh, here are the setting here are the evaluation settings of for NormGut in which we run a benchmark across six different methodologies. So first of all, Input times gradient and guided back propagation do not perform well due to their noisy saliency map pattern. Also, the accuracy of guided gradcam is in between guided back propagation and guided gradcam as expected, since it is the elementwise product of these two methods. Among, among all the methods except for norm grad, we see that gradcam provides more reliable saliency maps as you uh, see down here is pointing the target object of interest, but uh, still the list, all the methods except for norm grad, we, uh, we see why like, this may be uh, problematic when there exists like some image misclassifications. So uh, whenever the image comes in but interpreted wrong as the neural network, we, we may see like some sort of problems. Uh, which are mentioned in our paper. So, 
Uh, when we use normgrad, on the other hand, we elevate these problems and first we uh, localize on the target objects of interest and then uh, we accurately uh, say that um, the, the space, the seven six maps are directly targeted on the target object of interest. So, uh, in a sense, uh, norm grad. Matches... We should, uh, sorry to interrupt, we have okay. uh, three minutes, we should wrap up. So, yeah. norm grad methods demonstrate superior performance in our point in game benchmark comparing all of these five baseline models. So, I want to thank you for listening and you can find the source code of our paper in the link and also in the QR code. So for any questions about our work, I would be happy to answer them. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you. Tanner. So uh, now we have a three minute uh, presentation by, um, by Joseph. Uh, Uh, am I on? Yes, we hear you. Oh, great. Yes, please go ahead. Um, just add my slides here. Oh, I Uh, okay. Are you able to see the slides now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, great. So, um, my name is Joseph Paul Cohen. Um, as an intro to me, I, I work on all sorts of random projects uh, seen here, assistive tools for blind people, platforms for data sharing, uh, tools for uh, people researching just x-ray analysis with deep learning. And my primary goal is to increase access to healthcare, uh, largely using technology. Uh, uh, our, our work uh, today comes from the perspective that in order to reduce false positives, um, we need to move towards an, an AI physician symbiosis, right? And we believe we can do this using counterfactuals. Uh, the method we propose is called latent shift. Um, the approach works uh, with any encoder decoder pair, such as an auto encoder and classifier. Um, oh. Sorry, any auto encoder decoder pair, such as an auto encoder, uh, as well as a classifier. Uh, this approach generates an adversarial example to change the classifier's prediction, uh, but the movement is regularized by the decoder. Uh, we find that uh, using the IOU, um, using an intersection over union analysis, may not be the best because the bounding boxes and segmentations. Uh, we're not designed to explain the counterfactual difference in these images. Uh, in a reader study with radiologists, we find that the latent shift counterfactual provides an improvement in confidence, but only for true positive predictions. Uh, and then false positive predictions have a negligible improvement in confidence. Um, yeah, that's a summary. Thanks. All right, great. That was quick. Uh, so um, we could pretty much uh, go to the next three minutes. Bejit, around. Great, can you hear me? Yeah, that's yeah. perfect, please go ahead. Great, so the title of our paper is Understanding and Visualizing Generalization in Units. Um, so there's not much time, so I'll jump right in. Uh, in our paper, we use a data set of 973 prostate multiparametric MRI exams, even though we're just looking at the T2-weighted series. And we use these exams or this data set to evaluate the performance of several units, so 3D units, in terms of segmentation IOU accuracy. Uh, but in particular, what we do in our paper is we develop metrics which try, aim to predict this IOU accuracy on this test set without using the test set labels. Uh, the way we achieve that uh, is by developing a local receptive field analysis. So in this picture on the right, you get a very different uh, visualization of a, un of a unit by, uh, uh, by visualizing 
the feature patches that are extracted at each stage. So for example, um, in this figure here, a 3D MRI is, is provided as input, and each dot in, um, in this figure corresponds to uh, a, a dimensionally reduced feature patch at each stage. And the color corresponds to whether that feature, feature patch corresponded to or coded for uh, a prostate voxel or not. So in particular, uh, looking at the geometry of these samples, we can actually develop metrics for generalization. And one, one such metric would be clustering to evaluate whether the red dots separate from the blue dots. But we also develop roughness and confidence measures, which do not require any uh, labels, even on validation data. Um, and essentially what these are, are measures of the network stability and locality, respectively. So in particular, our, our work highlights some of uh, some interesting findings about the operation of CNNs, where we find that for samples that are classified correctly by, by well-trained networks, uh, the feature patches actually are far away from the data set. This is, you know, very non-intuitive and very different from what we expect from approximation theory. Uh, to sort of jump to the chase, uh, we evaluated the correlation of these different metrics on the data set level or the population level. And we, can, we were able to achieve a Pearson correlation coefficient of uh, with magnitude of 0 0.88 by using this perceptive field analysis, uh, which additionally enables extension to very large 3D networks or potentially, I guess, 4D networks. Um, but anyway, if you have more questions, please stop by our session or our poster. It's I3. Thank you. All right, great. So, uh, uh, so for the audience, I could see that there are a few questions from the chat. Uh, perhaps we will start with the questions from the study groups. Uh, there are a few actually, uh, so uh, uh, we will start in order, uh, I1, I2, I3. So uh, one of the questions that came from the uh, study group uh, is uh, um, for paper I1, uh, explainable image quality, uh, how and when does uh, norm grad fail? Uh, and is there an intuition of the difference between norm grad and grad can? Uh, good question. So there are, of course, some failure cases, uh, like there are some cases where grad cam actually performing better than norm grad. So uh, there are actually some cases about it. And on the difference uh, between norm grad and grad cam, we notice like two, uh, two things we can say. So first of all, it uses the exact same location in terms of gradients and the activations. So uh, we combine these two together and add in two different separate locations as in GradCam. So that's the first difference. And the second difference comes from the fact that NormGAD is actually using uh, Frobenius norm, not the other types of maximum type of nonlinearity approach to obtain a unified uh, spatial contribution. So um, yeah. That's pretty much it. Okay. Uh, maybe another question that I already have for uh, A1, I1. Um, yeah. Uh, did you try different reweighting schemes? What if weighting puts emphasis on the last layer where the abstraction is higher instead of putting the emphasis on the low level features? Uh, sorry, I couldn't understand the question. Can you repeat it again? Um, uh, did you try different reweighting schemes? Oh, okay. So, uh, that's actually a thing of consideration. Um, and we are actually also planning to perform some experiments with that. So, right now we just gain uniform rating um to the all of these layers if we will be combining them all but there are also some alternative weighting schemes uh in order to combine different layers okay okay thank you 
Thanks, Pedro. Okay, so there are a lot of questions. So uh, to, 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 to have a good balance, I'm moving to the second paper. I'm moving to a question for uh, Joseph. Um, so one question that came um, at the study groups is, uh, I guess it's not an obvious question. How would you evaluate the animation uh, itself in terms of what is, the, how to evaluate the added benefit uh, of, of the animation? I mean, it, because the, the evaluation remains subjective, right? So this is a question that came up. Yeah, so the, uh, so we found that um, IOU didn't really give us the quantitative uh, uh, difference that we wanted, uh, but so that's why we did a, a reader study where, I mean, our main goal was to see if we could prevent uh, prevent uh, false positive uh, predictions from getting getting past the physician. Um, so that that gave us some some metric where if um, if the animation could help convince them that the prediction was a false positive or predicted from the wrong feature or like causing some weird alteration, like there was some problem with the input image. Um, then it would convince them to not trust that image. Uh, so we, we just looked at if we could change the confidence in the model's prediction from a physician. And so this is, uh, it, it goes right to the end goal of the work, and I think it really it ties into give a, give you know, a really quantitative answer um, of inf uh, how, to, how to judge the animation. So comparing two different types of animations, you, you could use the same method um, uh, to do that. Um, I think going back, uh, another approach, uh, would be if we had segmentations that would capture the difference that the counterfactual should have, right? So for an enlarged heart, it's not just a segmentation of the entire heart, right? Uh, it should just be the outer um, the outer regions of the heart. But but also, as, as one reviewer pointed out, um, car cardiomegaly, there's, there's multiple ways to change an image, uh, to change the, the, um, the prediction of, of cardiomegaly. You can make the uh, the the chest bigger, and then the heart the heart ratio gets smaller, right? So there's there's multiple ways of changing that. Um, so then it's not even clear because the model would technically be right if it just made the chest bigger as well, right? So if your segmentations don't capture that, um, so it I think it's it's a it's difficult to do that without just having physicians judge the difference between these. Um, <laughs> But but then also there's the factor that it's the the model might not even be looking at the right things right so it's the 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 model uh, the the method can explain what the model is looking at and the model might be looking at the wrong things and therefore mm -hmm. the method is correct even though the segmentations aren't right so um, mm -hmm. I don't know it raises even more issues. Okay, maybe Arati has another question. Uh yeah. Uh, using a model as simple as an autoencoder certainly facilitates the work and the understanding of the concept. But uh, will it be worthy using a variational autoencoder, for example, to characterize the uncertainty of the generated images? Uh, yeah, I think. Um... The, the autoencoder was just a proof of concept to say, well, what's the simplest the simplest method to get this done? Uh, I think every every better representation, every better model is just going to improve the uh, the counterfactual images that are generated, right? So, um, if a variational autoencoder gives a better latent space that's able to better interpolate between um, you know one pathology being on or off, then um, then I think it's going to show up. Much better, and if you can get higher resolution models too, I think it's just going to be an improvement, right? So, uh, I think that the autoencoder is the maybe the worst model we could have used. We, sh we showed that it was sufficient, but it was definitely the worst. Like everything is an improvement on top of that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we could uh, move also to uh, Habijit. Uh, well, I think uh, Arati has uh, one or two questions to start with. Maybe one. Uh, yeah. For me, could you give the intuition behind the label three metrics of generalization, like the roughness and the confidence that you propose? Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, here's some intuition, right? So, normally, when you think of interpolation or approximation properties, what you hope for that is if you put a, a test sample that's close to the input sample or, or the training data set, you're going to get a very similar result. Right, so the stability metrics, such as the uh, the roughness, really is trying to measure how fast the the 
output or that function, the neural network function is, is oscillating around a query point. And the way we do that is by uh, ob observing, okay, what happens if I make a transition or if I, if I perturb um, an input sample, either at the, in either an input space that, that's you know, very common or within an interior uh, layer of the network. And if I perturb where, where, the, where the feature patch is occurring. So it's really looking at the great input output gradient of the whole network. Um, but you can also break that down into input output gradient of each stage of the network and try to evaluate how, how robust or how stable it is. The confidence metric on the other hand is looking at locality. Um, so, you know, as you would expect, if you put a sample that's right next to a training sample, um, you should get very similar results and hopefully the function's not oscillating. But what happens when you're far away from a training sample? And, and normally when we're dealing with very high dimensional data, such as MRIs, everything is far away from everything else. Um, if you compare it at, at the uh, sort of sample level, if you look at the whole image, right? Mm -hmm. But what we're doing in this analysis is looking at uh, distance in terms of the, the distance between feature patches. So the feature patches are much lower dimensional, for example, three by three by three. Um, and, and you can you can evaluate the distance between these feature patches of a given query input to the entire training manifold or data set um, to about, okay, how far away it is. And what we found is really surprising. It's, it, it's that the patches that are classified correctly are actually far away from the data set much further away than the training data set, but crucially, uh, the, the item that they're closest to is corresponds to the correct class. So in this case, it was prostate versus non prostate, but we also looked at, you know, a couple of, in, in our supplementary material, we include some results on CIFAR 10 um, from a couple of different, um, uh, you know, projects that we were sort of working on in the space. But I, I think that's very telling that uh, if we also look at the, the cluster, the correlation, for clustering, which relies on the label, it's negative, which indicate uh, which indicates better clustering. Um, so items that are closer in class um, are classified more correctly. But interestingly, the confidence has this negative correlation as well, which indicates things that are far away um, are also classified correctly. So it seems like those two things are diff very different. They turn out to be uh, to make a lot of sense if you think about it in the perspective of like an SVM um, at each layer. Okay. Okay. So uh, maybe one last That's question perfect. from the study groups uh, to 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 you before maybe we look a little bit into the chat uh, also. Uh, so it, let's say okay. So this is a bit of a high level question. Let's say generalizability is an issue. So it was detected in one layer. Then what next? Uh, uh, redesigning the the architecture. Uh, uh, how to measure an improvement? Um, uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll, tr I'll try this. It seems like there's a multi-part question, but I'll try with, with the first part, which is, or the second part, which is how do we use this to improve designs, right? So there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of work on regularization of the fe feature space, right? And I think a little bit of visualization of like the fully encoded layer. So for example, something that people do um, is you can, you can make sure that everything that's in the encoded layer has like norm one. For, for example, or it's on the unit sphere and you can measure angles between the, for features of different classes. Uh, and that's certainly regularization that you can apply. But what's not clear is if you don't apply that regularization, is that what networks do? And is that why they generalize? And what we're finding are these metrics. It's, it's very like heuristic, right? Like we're, we're, we think of an idea of how or why we think units work or neural networks in general work. And we're going and evaluating, okay, well, if that is really the metric of success, uh, can I evaluate, can I you know, write an algorithm to measure that, measure that property of the neural network and I should be able to predict success. Um, so in terms of informing design, it's a little bit hard to say because if you apply regularization, it usually helps regardless of what type of regularization you apply. But I think the way to look at this is a way to say, can I be more confident in my predictions? If it's, you know, if I not only get the final prediction output, if you look at the softmax value and it's 0 0.99, um, besides just that one number at the output, can you use the interior features or interior layers representations to get confidence that this network is processing the sample correctly? Um, it's sort of a roundabout answer, but I hope that sort of gets the intuition or the motivation for that work. Um, okay. 
Oh, great. Uh, I see also you're, you're answering directly some, some chat questions. So I'll go back to I1. Uh, uh, so there is one, uh, a few interesting questions also uh, for explainable image quality. So uh, mm -hmm. a question from, uh, uh, from Laura, how do you see the possibility of using a foreign object recognition approach in scenario where a large majority of the training data does not contain a label for the foreign object or for the abnormality. So I see that we still have got like some limited data for that target specified object of interest. So this regard is actually dependent to how we train the uh, pre-trained neural network model so that it will also try to find that target of object of interest. So if you use our resampling schemes to equalize the sampling of that target object of interest, that's still fine. I mean, up to some extent, of course, because there will be still some uh, performance losses since it's underrepresented. But uh, for, from the side of Normgrad, um, if we do it correctly, and if we see it like uh, we get some appropriate classification results, um, we also expect the method to find those target object target object of interest correctly. Okay. Okay, that's uh, good. Maybe uh, to go back to uh, Joseph, one more question from the study group. Um, so uh, the question is, why does the image deform when blinking? So there are areas uh, other than uh, obvious abnormality, like for instance, heart, and lung, and chest wall that uh, that blinks in animation. So uh, maybe some comments on this? Uh, oh, yeah. So I think these are imperfections in the model. OK. Uh, it's just bad. The classifier is looking at the wrong uh, aspects of the image. Um, OK. I mean, it could also be that the autoencoder is not able to move independent of these, um, but I, I I believe it's more so um, that the, the classifier is is uh, is like is looking at those regions slightly. You know, maybe it like learns some general way to predict from the actual pathology, and then it wants to kind of game the system. So it looks at some like other features, you know, outside of that to get the the best performance, right? Um, okay. And then that that manifests itself as as uh, you know, those regions just being slightly predictive um, and then it moves them around. Like, I think a, a, one major thing that, that we know about is the view um, that it can be in this data set and is definitely correlated with uh, different pathologies. So if you have pneumonia, you, you're likely going to get an, uh, um, an AP supine, right? Or like the, the view of your chest X-ray is going to be different and you're going to have features where like your chest is going to be looked at from a different perspective. And you can see these, you can see this little residual in the in the in the chest X-ray, um, so the network could just easily look at that as well and say, "Well, I'm going to predict pneumonia or some pathology, but also I know, like, if they're laying down, you know, I have a little bit of a higher probability of them having these pathologies." And you know, to the loss function, this is what wins the game, right? So it's gonna um, it's gonna like use that to like get a little edge by kind of looking at these extra uh, correlated features. Okay. Okay, great. So I don't know whether Arati has further questions, or maybe we could. Uh, uh, there are many questions in the chat too. Yeah, there's many questions in the chat. I think. Yeah. We can do like a, um one for a eight. Um, how do you adopt levels in the lower dimensional feature maps? Okay, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it was for me. Um, so there's a couple of different ways you could do it, but the one the one I'm, the one way I mentioned in the chat, which is predominantly the way we use in the paper, is to downsample or follow the architecture, uh, which, which involves downsamp, which is a little bit of blurring and downsampling um, of the ground truth image at each layer. So so these are image to image models that we're looking at. So the ground truth is specified pixel wise or voxel wise. So if we follow the architecture backwards, you know, starting at the end, you can get back into an encoded layer. And it's sort of important that that encoded layer is not, you know, it's it's not like one by one or something, right? It, it's it's like 32 by 32 or, you know, some function of the number, the input dimension size. So as long as that's big enough, 
Um, yeah. Those feature maps tend to make a lot, a lot of sense. Uh, but absolutely, there are different ways to do it. Um, you can thread it through. So, for example, if you want to use GradCam even to visualize feature maps to every layer, um, that's that's another way to to sort of to translate labels. So you can look at how the out, final output pixel changes if you perturb any given input patch. But it's it's very expensive to do that, which is why we don't do it. But um, that is another okay. potential way. We have to stop here. I mean, uh, there are a lot of questions in the chat, uh, and there is also the discussion during the poster session. So uh, I will encourage the audience to go to the poster session and to uh, to discuss with the authors. Uh, I don't know whether Arati has something for closing the sessions. Uh, uh, no, that uh, just saying uh, thank you to everyone and also to the speakers. And uh, that the all the manuscripts all they were very interesting and also the discussion. So um so yeah. thank you everybody. Yeah. Bye now. So I guess I hand uh, over to the organizers. Yeah, um thanks a lot, Ismail and Arat for joining uh, for sharing this this nice session and the great discussion afterwards.